go back. It is the reason why I don't know where we're sitting. It doesn't matter. Just jump in there. Wherever you want. Two degrees. The first, the first race they run down here. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to over six hours. Oh my God. can't find the other one. They were usually the first one here. Slack ass. They were usually the first one here. We can't find them. Did anybody tell me it's over there? I think so. But Angie just went to find it too. <laughs> Good afternoon, welcome to the Bojangles Southern 500. I'm Steve Post from Motor Racing Network and it's uh, such a special day we have here today with this race. I think it's so amazing, the, the um, iconic paint schemes and the stories that go with them. And uh, today, uh, it's a little bit of a story that goes with an iconic paint scheme. Joining us on the stage uh, is uh, Bubba Wallace, driver of the number 43 SDP Chevy Camaro and also Richard Petty, team owner and uh, member of the NASCAR Hall of Fame. And in news of today, uh, sort of like 1972, uh, there's been a change on the number 43 as Richard Petty Motorsports and STP have agreed that they will put the Dayglow red colors on the number 43 car for today's race. Uh, that transition has happened in the garage area just a little bit ago. And basically this is a compromise, as it was always the case in 1972 between Richard Petty and CEO of STP, Andy Granatelli, uh, wrestling for space on the car between the Dayglow Red and the Petty Blue. Uh, this paint scheme with Petty Enterprises raced to four championships and four wins in the Daytona 500. So uh, Richard, I guess, um, it's, it, it's kind of interesting. We're having the same discussion and putting the red on the car as we did in 1972. Share with us the story of 1972 and how the first uh, negotiations went on this. Yeah, I know a lot of people's heard it, I guess, but, uh, you know, we had been talking to Andy on the telephone and, you know, getting ready for the following year, getting ready for 72, I guess. And uh, we built the car, uh, and it was a blue car, and we sent it on to Daytona, to uh, Riverside. Riverside. That was the first race of the year. And uh, so myself and uh, Dale Inman and my brother Maurice stopped in Chicago to try to work out some situations for 72. And we sat there across the desk and probably within an hour we said, okay, this is what Petty Enterprise is going to do and this is what um, STP is going to do and this is what we expect of each other. And, you know, it went, it went pretty good. And... Uh, so I said, okay, we shook hands. I said, okay, that's the deal. And uh, when I got up to, to get ready to go to Riverside uh, and catch a plane, then uh, Grand Teller said, the car will be they go red. And I said, no way. I said, my car has always been blue, and that's the way it's going to be. And uh, so we, I had got up and, and really went to the door and was, I'm out of here, guys. And uh, Bill Dredge, who was her PR man, said, wait a minute, we Maybe we can work this out. So I sent Dale and Chief, uh, my brother, on the, the Riverside that night. And uh, then uh, we sat there with Dredge and we drawed up some pictures and stuff and finally decided on a half and half. Uh, you know, half they go red and half blue. And uh, But the car was already at 
at Riverside uh, at being a blue car. So we went and flew flew out that morning and about 10.30, uh, was in LA and uh, Grant Taylor and myself made the announcement. And at the same time at the racetrack, uh, Dale and them put the STP decal on the side of the car. And uh, so that, then we got lucky and won the race. So it was a, it was a good start for us. <laughs> and then uh, from then on, you know, it was gonna be red and blue. And when the contract come in two or three weeks, he had a paragraph in there for fifty thousand dollars. We'll give you an extra fifty thousand dollars if you paint the car red. So I just marked through it and put my little initial, and sent it back. So uh, that's, that's basically the way it started. It kind of a weird deal, but at that time you didn't have to go through all the doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs to to make contracts. I was running Petty Enterprises, and he was running STP. So we made the agreement, and it was a done deal. So. We'll give it to the lawyers and let them figure it out. Bubba, when you hear this story in our era where a sponsor is the lifeblood of the sport, would you ever argue over color as far as the sponsor of a car goes? No, no, <laughs> I wouldn't. I would be, all right, that's fine, whatever. Uh, you can paint whatever color you want as long as it's fast. So uh, it, it's pretty cool to hear that story and, and how you just mark through it. Like, oh, it's a done deal, sign my initials, and... Uh, on its way, but um, the, the biggest part that stands out is hell. They they won the first race, so no pressure. <laughs> what does it mean to you? We talked about that paint scheme that you will now have on the car today. Four championships, four Daytona 500 wins. What is it? And really, over the course of this year uh, and and even last year, what has it meant to you to to drive such an iconic race car and and this particular paint scheme today? Yeah, you know, the first day on the on the job, Inman had told me never be late to anything. Always be on time. And, uh -oh. look, and look who's walking in. Wow. <laughs> you mess me, you won't be walking. If he'd have been on time all the time, I could have been a lot better because he'd give me a better car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> have you ever seen him carry that car? <laughs> I never, I've seen you push it. I didn't see you carry it either. This happens all the time, and it's great. Uh, we're at the shop. And they come in every Tuesday morning, and they just lay in each other, and it's so funny. Uh, but back to what you asked, you know, driving such an iconic car. I mean, I jumped into it last year at Pocono and knew the history and how big of a, a moment it was for me and, and for, the, for the sport. And, and I'm still living that dream of, like, like kind of surreal. You know, I'm driving the 43, representing these two knuckleheads here and, and, and having a lot of fun doing it. And uh, we're continuing to push the envelope, trying to get better and better. And uh, we, all, we all sit in the lounge at times, and we're all frustrated, you know, and trying to, you know, be better and do the right thing. And, and uh, we all have the same vision, though. So that's, that's the biggest thing. None of us are pulling in different directions. Hall of Fame Crew Chief Dale Inman is here. And Dale, as uh, Richard shared the story about the Chicago meeting, going to Riverside, Daytona, all of that, from the crew chief, from the guy who actually has to apply all the colors and everything, what was that like for you, the, the process to get from uh, – this morning it was peeling off some uh, decals. What, what, what was that like for you to change that car over and be part of that process? Well, when we went to the Riverside was the first race, and the car was on the way to Riverside. And me and Richard Maurice went by Chicago and talked to Granatelli. And the big discussion, the biggest discussion was, of course, it wasn't very much money in today's <laughs> standards, but uh, was to get. Um, and Granatelli wanted day glow solid, and Rich said, no, he's, he's pretty hard-headed, so we had to have petty blue on it, too, and that was good. But at Riverside, we ran it solid blue with just the decal on it like it was yesterday. And then, of course, uh, we went, wound up winning the race. It was cut a few laps short on account of fog <laughs> coming in, so that's another story. But uh, <laughs> we wound up winning that race, and, uh, and then Granatelli, you know, he was – Still stubborn and everything, and but we signed Buddy Baker. He signed Buddy Baker for ten races, and we had a Dodge left over from the year before, so it was painted solid. They go with number eleven, but the forty-three was always day glow and blue, starting at Daytona, and um, it's just been like that for a long time, you know. And we certainly appreciate STP and what they've done for it. And but one of the things that Granatelli said up there that night. Me and Maurice left that evening or that night in a blizzard trying to get to California. And Richard and Andy came the next morning, and uh, 
I remember Granatelli saying, now, Richard, you stick with me and you'll be as famous as I am. So I'll let y'all judge on that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he was such a promoter at that point in time. It was unreal. And, uh, of course, there was a – Ralph Salvina was there in California waiting on us. He's, he's still out there. And what a great man he was for STP. And we had a – Basil Bacon was one of them. And then who was the other? Bill called? Dredge. Bill Dredge. I know he told me, he said, Inman, you do anything but commit murder, and I'll make good, good press out of it. So, <laughs> and, and they were way ahead of their – and you know, still are in their times, and uh, you know what a what a great run it's been for us. Great indeed, that's for sure. Dale, one of the things that was the case in '72 and the case here today is the challenge of Darlington. And you guys know what it's like. You've won the Southern 500. From a crew chief's perspective, uh, we know it's a big challenge. Has that challenge changed, or is it still really the same today as it was then? Well, it it's certainly a different challenge, but. You, you've got to survive the thing. That, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's, that's the main object. But, uh, you know, we, you got to go back and I don't know where any, you know what I'm talking about, but uh, Bubba, you ought to try it without power steering. <laughs> <laughs> and without, without. I'm waiting on it. <laughs> but uh, we spent a lot of time setting the front ends here, just trying to get it where he could last all day and the caster just right so it would turn as easy and still be under control. But, uh, and, you know, we've always been to a, sometimes it was a tire problem, but, you know, it's just a different world here today, but it's still a challenge. you got to finish the place and, uh, and the heat too, you know what I mean? So it, it's just, it's so hard to compare today to what we've seen. Of course, I come down here in 1951 with the Petty family, but about seven years before he drove so with his dad so <laughs> I've, i have seen some changes seen a few southern 500s we have uh just about four or five minutes with uh with bubba for a question and, and richard and dale i think have a little bit more time so if we have a question specifically for bubba right now um al let's start down here with uh and get the microphone down to al al pierce uh yeah bubba al pierce from auto week a couple of years ago you might have been ross Justine. Right. You might have been you might have been racing a big time guy at Darlington for the win. What would Bubba Wallace have done yesterday? Anything different, or would you have wow. done what he did? Wow, that's a loaded question right there. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't see leading up to that point. All I seen was Ross had a lap car in front of him, and Harvick used it as a pick, which was right. And uh, I mean, there's there's one groove on the exit of turn two and uh they both got by the lap car at the same time so still ross kind of had the, the spot and in these cars nowadays when you get on their outside i mean there's you're just long for the ride and so it's unfortunate for for ross i was pulling for him that's pretty cool as much as we run into each other on sundays you know it's still cool to see that's an awesome story to hear about uh when when, when the guys that run mid-pack and don't get talked about much get into finally something that's good equipment and make the most of it he was doing that so um he has a couple more opportunities, I believe. But uh, what I would do different, I don't know, get around that lap car a little quicker. I don't know. Will, will that help him down the road? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, what, showing what he did um, yesterday, winning both stages, just kind of dominating the field, uh, and then had a hiccup. Uh, the, the retaliation or his car was out of control. Um, <laughs> Hey, I mean, you're, you're going for something, and, and moments like that, and you know, I've been in that spot before where you're, you're trying to go out and make the most of every opportunity, and someone comes up and takes that away from you. It's the most devastating thing possible, and that's where the emotions come in. That's where you get frustrated. So uh, do what you got to do. Do we have other questions for, for Bubba? We'll, we'll open it up for Richard. Yeah, uh, Jacob, uh, back in the middle. Um, if we can get Mike. There we go. Go ahead, right, Jacob. Jacob Zielman, Speed Sport. Uh, Bubba, for you, to uh, you talked earlier this season about how driving for this team in itself is a motivator to want to go out and do well. What does it mean to you to be able to pilot a scheme that has so much history with, as you called them, those two knuckleheads sitting next to you? Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun, you know, having 
having them here and just being a part of the team. My, my, my group of guys are, are, are fun to be around. They make it enjoyable to be at the racetrack. They're definitely a pick-me-up when we when we go to the tracks where I struggle at. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're your biggest fans, and that's what you need. And we all push the same envelope. You know, when they mess up, I'm there to uh, – I try to be there to, to motivate them after I give them a, a chewing, but it's all right. Uh, they, they do the same thing. So we all, like I said earlier, we all vibe in the same direction. We're all pushing the same message, and that's what makes it fun going to the racetrack. You know, we, we, we're kind of an unknown when we show up. We don't know, you know what we got for that weekend, but it, it's fun learning what we have and, and trying to make that better. Bubba, we're going to cut you loose because we know you've got another commitment here today. We've got four or five minutes still with Dale and with Richard, so we appreciate your time, Bubba Bear, here and joining us. We certainly wish you the best tonight here in the Bojangles Southern 500. Uh, questions for Richard or Dale? Uh, let's go over on the far side there where uh, Hill Overton is. Um, get a microphone over to Hill, and uh, then we'll come back and grab you, Jacob, on another one here. But um, there we go. Go ahead, Hill. Right here, Richard. I see you. Yeah, man. One of your throwback buddies from back in the day. <laughs> You've had a long and illustrious career driving, and particularly so here. This has been the track too tough to tame. We all know that for everybody. What was the toughest aspect of this place for you to get around? The toughest deal for me was just finishing as, as good as I run. Uh, we always ran good here, uh, or I felt like we did. I really loved the racetrack because it was so different than than anything was running. So it was a real challenge from the driving standpoint. Uh, you know, we run some races that no matter how good or bad you run, you win races at. Uh, this was one of the racetracks I really run good at, or I thought I did, but I never could finish good. So me and the track didn't get along on that, that part of it. But we always look forward to coming down here because it was such a challenge. And uh, the deal was being able to run 500 miles or 400 miles or whatever the race was, and you not have no trouble, and then somebody else had trouble that, that you get into. So, it, again, it just wasn't one of my lucky racetracks. Two distinct differences, the big end of the track here in turns one and two, used to be three and four, and then one, two, uh, in the old days, was the tight end. Did you and Dale try to set up better for one end, or was it a compromise for both? We just tried to get around the racetrack. <laughs> you know, basically, uh, you know, the – where it's, what, one and two now, three and four. It used to be three and four. It was just a single run racetrack, and it had a guardrail. And that's where the, the Darlington stripe came about because it left stripes because the guardrail had different uh, contours of it. Uh, now they don't have Darlington stripes. You have Darlington crashes, <laughs> okay? <laughs> when the side of the car is tore up, you don't just run into the wall. So uh, it's just a completely different racetrack when they changed it. And, uh, you know, the, the big deal was it, would, it really made probably a better racetrack out of it because now you can run, run side by side through both corners. Before it was a one groove racetrack in one corner and a two groove in the other. So, uh, you know, it just, it's changed over the time, but no matter what, it's still Darlington. We'll go to Jacob and then down to Kenny. So, Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, Richard, uh, Jacob Seelman, Speed Sport. Uh, I was actually at the uh, original unveil of the throwback at the Hall of Fame. Was this kind? Was this compromise always in the plan, or was this, as the release said, something that came out came about over the weekend? Oh, the unveiling this this, this unveiling the car this one. This is some of these uh, PR people from STP's idea. Okay. <laughs> You know, which, which was good because it shows the progression of, of how we came along, how we got involved with STP, uh, you know, and, and so they, they wanted to, to really go to the throwback of how they got started in cup racing with us and how, how it was done. So that's what this is all about. Okay, we'll get on here to Kenny. Kenny? Kenny Bruce with KennyBruce.net. Richard, I know everybody will tell us that, you know, all the mile-and-a-half tracks – aren't exactly alike. Every one of them's a little bit different. But did the sport lose something when we stopped having tracks come on board that were different and stood out like Darlington, like North Wilkesboro, like Rockingham? Because there's nothing like those on the schedule. Yeah, you know, the, the big deal was, back in the day again, was the variety of places we run. And now, like you say, you got four or five racetracks that's a mile and a half and they're I call them cookie cutter operations. You know what I mean? The racing's different on them. Don't get me wrong, but the challenge is about the same. 
as far as being able to set up the cars and stuff for them. But, you know, used to, you, you know, you'd run Darlington and then you'd run Charlotte or then you'd run Martinsville or Wilkesboro or Rockingham. Everything was completely different. So basically when it comes to Dale and them setting up the car, the chassis or the body and stuff was the same, but all the suspension and stuff was was really different. And now if you get a pretty good setup on one of the mile and a half, then you're going to be pretty good on all the rest of it. Question over there. Go ahead, sir. Mike Massey with FrenchStretch.com. Um, Richard, your dad raced here back when they had 80 cars going around this track. I just got to ask you, what was that like to see? What would what was it like when you had 80 cars on the track when your dad <laughs> ran? It was well, a long day okay. for sure. <laughs> yeah, the the first the first race they ran here lasted over six hours. Okay, but at the time the track had a single groove around the top of the racetrack, and then it was just almost flat. Nobody got up and and ran the top groove. Everybody was running around the inside of the racetrack. So you know you had. My dad was running a six-cylinder Plymouth, so you know they wasn't running very fast. Probably 80 <laughs> mile an hour. <laughs> At the end of the straightaway. But uh, the the deal was that's the way it started. And in doing that, the cars wasn't running, but like you said, 80 or 90 mile an hour, and the track was so wide there was plenty of room for that many cars. Now you put 40 cars out there, and now the tracks, because of the way the track is and the speeds and stuff, then there's not that much room. So it was a completely different situation because there was there was running slow enough to make enough room for everybody to run. Fascinating stuff. Mike Neff, go ahead, Mike. Mike Neff, also from FrontStretch.com. Richard, uh, we're here celebrating STP and what they meant to Petty Enterprises. Looking at the current form of Petty Enterprises, what does it mean having a company like STP as part of your sponsorship family and helping keep you guys getting to the racetrack? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of a deal. I think this is 46, 48 years or something. I mean, anyhow, since 1972, I remember how many years that gives. That they, they have been a backer of us. And you got to figure STP was owned by, I think, five or six different companies in all the, all the times that we've been involved with them. But every time a new company bought STP and put it in their portfolio, they were still stayed racing. Maybe not as full bore as maybe they used to, but they were still operating with uh, basically Petty Enterprises with, with the Petty family. So uh, I, I guess we kind of grew up together and, uh, and we're still family, and that's the main thing. Here we have a final question over here. Go ahead, sir. Steve Swartz of the Alaska Press. Richard, uh, did Andy Granatelli ever kiss you in victory lane like you did Mary Andretti? <laughs> he tried to, okay. I think uh, we ran 70, we won the race in 73 at Daytona. Okay, 73 at Daytona. We won the race, and here he come charging in there and had his arms all out. Man, I was you know, doing everything I could to get away from him because I'd seen him, he picked up uh, – Andretti had Indy and kissed him, you know what I mean? So I knew it was coming, so uh, I, I, so I kind of stayed away, but uh, we got some pictures of me turning my head when he he come charging in there. But, again, I knew what he was going to do, so uh, I was playing defense on him. <laughs> Head of the curve, that is for sure. Richard and Dale, uh, we appreciate the time here today. Uh, we appreciate the story, the story of 1972, and uh, having the opportunity here today to relive it here at Darling Today. We wish you guys the best here tonight in the Bojangles Southern 500. Thank you all. Have a good day.